Welcome to this rapid revision video, this time focused on individual genius. Today we'll be looking at Renaissance doctor Thomas Sydenham, the English Hippocrates. Improving understanding of disease. During the Renaissance, many ideas from the Middle Ages were still being followed, especially those of the ancient doctors Hippocrates and Galen, who were an ancient Greek and an ancient Roman, respectively. However, one English doctor, Thomas Sydenham, was trying to make progress. He felt that he was just using good Hippocratic ideas of observation and diagnosis, but actually he was quietly changing the way that illness was diagnosed and how cures were attempted. So how much of his work represents change and progress? And how much represents continuity? After all, he was known as the English Hippocrates. Did he really take Hippocrates' ideas further? Thomas Sydenham was born in 1624 and died in 1689, which is not a bad innings really for back then. He was known as the English Hippocrates, partly because of the methods that he used, and he trained at Oxford University. However, the English Civil War in 1642 cut his studies short. That might have actually been helpful, though, because it meant that Sydenham began his studies and gained a familiarity with the basics, but then was more free to go out and seek his own ideas. Sydenham decided that each disease was different and therefore it needed to be individually identified. Following on from this, each disease also required a different cure to work. He believed in observation and diagnosis, just like Hippocrates, and letting nature take its course with illness rather than trying to cure everything at random. He would also encourage the taking of the pulse as a method of diagnosis, recognising that sick people often had an increased heart rate. Thomas Sydenham published his findings in Observations Medicae in 1676, which was printed and widely shared all over Europe in a variety of languages. He also discovered Sydenham's cholera and showed the difference between scarlet fever and measles. This was important because scarlet fever and measles actually had outwardly quite similar symptoms. Previously, doctors had tried to treat the symptoms rather than the underlying disease, and Sydenham was able to demonstrate that each needed its own specific cure. Sydenham was a Christian, but he did not believe that God caused disease, only that God gave people the ability to recognise and fight it. In other words, diseases came from the natural world, and God created that, but God did not specifically send disease to man. Sydenham compared diseases to plants and animals. This isn't quite the same as identifying germs as a cause of disease, but it was along the right lines. He also took advantage of new ingredients that were being discovered all over the world, supposing that an environment would contain not only the disease, but therefore the cure too, as part of God's plan. Here's an example of that. In zones that had malaria, which is actually caused by mosquitoes, he found that there was the bark from a particular plant or tree, the chinchona, which was used to treat malaria. It turns out we now understand that this contains a, a substance called quinine, which does indeed combat the real illness. Sydenham's work can be seen as part of the early part of what we now call the Enlightenment, so it's worth a brief mention. In 1660, the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, better known as the Royal Society, was set up. This was a sign that the king was supporting the development of new scientific ideas, hence why it was called the Royal Society, rather than just the Society of London. Scientists would discuss new ideas in science and medicine, and importantly, they would challenge the old ideas. They would carry out experiments and use new technology like microscopes. The Royal Society's findings were widely published in printed books and journals. The age of the Enlightenment, where people felt free to question religious explanations about scientific ideas, was about to begin. Think about what Sydenham did. He questioned the idea that God caused disease in and of itself. He also questioned many of the old traditional ideas. And yet at the same time, he used the observation and diagnosis that Hippocrates had been talking about really since ancient Greek times. So he has both progress and change, but also elements of continuity to his work. So with Thomas Sydenham identifying that diseases needed specific cures, and with the Royal Society encouraging further scientific explanations and investigations, the problems must have been solved. Well, not quite. Ordinary people, and many doctors for that matter, still believed superstitious and ancient ideas about medicine and disease. Theories like miasma were still thought to cause illness. And people still didn't know what actually caused disease, meaning that many treatments remained ineffective. Here's an example which we'll look at 
in future in its own video. The Great Plague of 1665, which occurred in London during Thomas Sydenham's lifetime. It was treated in very similar ways to the Black Death over 300 years earlier. So how much progress was there? Let's have a look at the final points. So does Thomas Sydenham deserve the title, the English Hippocrates? Well, there are co contrasting opinions here. On the one hand, yes, he does. He was the English Hippocrates. He built on Hippocratic ideas and improved them, like believing in natural causes of illness and by observing and diagnosing specific diseases. But on the other hand, perhaps no, he doesn't. He was not responsible for much progress. He did little to improve health in general, and he still did not understand the actual causes of disease, even if he did make improvements in identifying different illnesses and how they should be treated. Ultimately, it's going to be up to you to make your mind up. Do you think that this is a good example of change in progress, or do you think more has stayed the same? You can mentally make your own mark on the continuum at the bottom of the screen here. That's the end of this rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful for you and has given you the main points of Thomas Sydenham's life and his work as a doctor. If it has, please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say thanks very much for watching and good health.